We're here to idea everyone, to fire up your curiosity and connect you with the people and ideas that shape our world. Watch, listen, understand, connect, create. Let's move the human story forward together. Every year in the ancient Swiss town of St. Gallen, the students of its university organize a symposium attracting leaders and thinkers from all over the world. One topic often under discussion is the impact of new technology and whether recent innovations are to be feared or welcomed. Amongst this year's speakers was Jan Gutz, a quantum physicist who is also co-founder of IQM Quantum Computers. The firm's products are now being installed in research labs and supercomputing centres across the world. I'm Neil Koenig and I began this interview for IdeaMe by asking Jan Gutz to explain how he first became interested in quantum computing. My background is in physics, so I um, have an education in physics and was more on a scientific track first. And then at some point I decided together with three co-founders actually to start a company, to spin out a company from Aalto University in Helsinki, Finland. Um, and this is what I'm doing now since 2019. And we have developed with the company to be now the largest effort actually from Europe to build and commercialize quantum computers. Okay, what's a quantum computer? A quantum computer is a machine, as the name says, that is a computer. So it computes for you um, tasks like mathematical tasks and other tasks. So this is the word computer in it. Uh, really a machine that uh, where you program a question in and then after some time you get an answer back. Um, the word quantum in quantum computer means that it uses quantum physics to do so. So it's not as a conventional computer using transistors and the, the laws of classical physics, but it uses so-called quantum bits, so the quantum version of a transistor. And the clue here is that in the quantum world where it computes the answer, it can actually take shortcuts. And the shortcuts, they are so powerful that they don't give you maybe only a factor of two or three of Im improvement in the speed, but it can really take shortcuts that allow you to solve problems which would otherwise take thousands or millions of years, even on the most powerful computers that we have. And you could do those um, in a matter of minutes maybe on a quantum computer if we had a very large scale one. So at the moment, we are not there yet. This is just the beginning, but the big promise is actually that the quantum computer will solve your problems, which otherwise Otherwise, you will never get the answer um, for using conventional computers. What sort of problems are we talking about that you would want to use a quantum computer for that you can't do, you can't um, solve this problem at the moment? Yeah, well, that's the, the relevant question. And the interesting um, fact here is that quantum computers actually um, have the potential to solve problems for all kinds of industries. Um, and you can start, for example, using material science, so the development of better materials, for example, solar cells um, or better uh, batteries, um, where you actually use the quantum computer to simulate exactly what's happening on a molecular level um, in, in these devices. But also quantum computers are uh, very good in all kinds of optimization problems. So, for example, um, if you want to do traffic optimization uh, for self-driving cars, uh, reduce the traffic, uh, reduce the waiting time, maybe in traffic jams. And it can go all the way to finance, predicting, for example, financial crisis or doing also their optimization of, of portfolio. So that's the interesting part that as a conventional computer, it's a problem-solving machine. It's an enabler for solutions, but the solutions can come from any kind of industry. And this is why at the moment there's such a big interest in this technology, because it's really a very disruptive technology that may allow all kinds of new solutions from different industries. What does a quantum computer look like? At the moment, these are still machines that look very much like the vacuum tube kind of computers that they were there in the very early days. So it's really a small room filled with all kinds of electronics and cables. And um, the word computer actually, it was used for the people who were operating back in the day, these machines. And also this is still something that we have. So the computer, the quantum computers that we are building, they are still, you, usually you have someone in the room who's helping um, with the kind of operation of the device. And this shows you that we are really in the early days. 
And of course, the assumption here is that in a similar way as for the conventional computing, these devices will develop over the next decades and there's a lot of potential for miniaturization for scaling up. But at the moment, it's really still a machine that fills a small room a few meters uh, by, by a few meters. Um, and it's a physical machine uh, where the computation actually still happens on a chip. But these chips, for example, in, in our case, they need to be cooled down to very low temperature. So you have these cooling devices, you have all kinds of control electronics. It's a physical setup. Um, it's a computing machine in the end. But this isn't just at the experimental stage now. You're actually selling these things, are you? That's correct. So the whole field comes from the kind of academic sector and people have been building first prototypes since the early 2000s um, in the kind of physics labs in the universities. And there was a few kind of events, for example, in I think it was around 2015 or so, when Google announced that they will build their own uh, quantum computers. So these were kind of wake up calls for the community, also for the uh, investor community. And we saw um, startups um, popping up first in the US, usually Europe is a bit later, um, to, to build and commercialize those computers. So this has now been going on for a few years. And we are now in a stage actually where we have um, companies, established companies, but also startups selling those machines. So for, for our company, we have sold and delivered already a few machines. Um, but um, there is a but to this. So it's not so that at the moment industry is using it um, to create kind of commercial value, but the clients or the customers here are scientific computing centers. So these are scientists who use those machines for scientific computing. And we assume that the first commercial use cases are still a few years down the road from now. How much does one of your computers cost? There's no such thing like a list price. Um, it depends very much on the project. You can st still see it as a kind of, as a project that we are selling to these computing uh, centers. Um, but and then these are these are public figures. Um, IBM has sold the system to Fraunhofer in, in Germany for around 40 million. Um, the system that we sold in Finland was around 20 million. We have a similar um, number for a system we sold in Munich. So this is kind of it gives you an order of magnitude. So it's a, a very costly device, but of course there is a lot of strategic value in this technology, and it's also a race about who has access to the technology because some of the use cases um, that maybe I didn't mention so far are also related to cybersecurity, encryption. Um, there, there might be dual use um, cases for those devices as well. So governments actually have a huge strategic interest to make sure that this technology kind of is accessible for them. Presumably there might be some military applications. There are, uh, and this is what I meant with dual use, right? Um, often, so for example, if you think about pattern recognition, um, which is one of these AI use cases where also a quantum computer um, can speed up, um, it's a use case that you can um, do for the, um, let's say, the civilian use, but then also for military use. And, and there are quite a few of them. So if you want to optimize the shape of an aircraft wing, so fluid dynamics, um, you find applications that can be done with quantum computers. But of course, you can improve the shape of a, let's say, civilian aircraft, but you can also improve the shape of other objects that fly uh, through the air. So this is what I meant with dual use. And this is something, um, of course, for new technologies, where it's always a, a trade-off with, OK, when do we want to start regulating? Because in the beginning, we are now still in the very early stages. Um, maybe we don't want to regulate too much because it might limit the development of the technology. On the other side, we also don't want that the technology goes into the wrong hands. Um, and this is why at the moment we are in these conversations together with governments and other um, stakeholders about what should be regulated for quantum computers and, and what's the best way of doing it going forward. Is there a kind of roadmap for the industry that in 5, 10, 20 years time everyone will have a quantum computer in their iPhone. So there is a roadmap and, and that's kind of where the commercialization comes in and it's not anymore an academic university effort. So as a normal computer, the, the key component is the processor. Um, and we as a company and many other companies, we develop those processors um, and um, in generations. So every other year or so, we release a new processor generation and then there's a jump in computing power. And there's a very clear roadmap going, going forward and, and most of the companies out there have such a roadmap. Um, and 
to answer your question about the kind of will we have it in our mobile phones, I think that's a little bit more um, difficult to answer because the way at the moment computing is developing is that we use a lot of our mobile phones but the actual computation is not happening in our mobile phones. So if you want uh, to use um, a service um, to give you the best, um, let's say, traffic route from A to B, it's not that your mobile phone um, computes the route, but actually the mobile phone sends this problem to a computing center or data center, and there the solution is computed, and then the answer is being sent back. And it's going to be the same for quantum computers. So the quantum computer most likely will not sit inside your mobile phone, but your mobile phone will be connected to a quantum computer, and the quantum computer will just give the answer in a very, let's say, fast manner than back to the, to the phones. Back to the days of the mainframe. I mean, it's not that we are reinventing the wheel, and I think that's the good thing here. We, we can use a lot of energy, uh, anal uh, analogies and learnings from the conventional semiconductor industries. And of course, also, we use a lot of technology that is being used for semiconductor industries. So the chips that we are producing, we use the same tools, we use the same kind of factories, these kind of semiconductor plants. Um, it's just the way we are designing the chips and the, maybe the materials that we are using and the way we are operating them is different and, and this makes them quantum. But we are benefiting a lot, of course, from an already existing supply chain um, in the conventional semiconductor and computing industry. There's a lot of anxiety at the moment about AI and also the power of devices like quantum computers. Is that a concern? Of course, it's a very hot topic now with the generative AI and all these things coming up. Quantum computers, as I said, are an enabling um, technology, for example, to run AI algorithms on them. Um, and there are many ideas um, how you could um, implement AI algorithms um, more efficiently in quantum computers. Um, so in this sense, I think the concern is more on the application side, not so much on the enabling technology side. I think where it becomes tricky is if those technologies become very independent in the way they kind of take decisions and, and do things. Um, and this is the discussions we have around self-driving cars, right? What happens if the self-driving car hits a child and, and who is responsible? So I think this is the, where, it, where it gets challenging because these technologies that we are now developing, they have the capability to become very independent and maybe even take independent decisions as a car, do I turn right or left? And what is there? There's the old lady on the left and the young child on the right, right? What, what, which decision do I take? And I think this is where it becomes challenging. Quantum computers as such are not the decision makers. They are the machines where these algorithms run on. So I think the question is very much on this application algorithm side, um, on, for example, with AI and how to regulate those um, algorithms. Nevertheless, for all those involved in this industry, whatever part they're playing, this must be something at the back of your minds. Sure, and I'm discussing this, of course, a lot um, because, as you said, also there is always this dual use aspect um, and there's this ethical question. It's also a question of trust. Do we trust a certain technology? Uh, I think a good example here is the um, example of the vaccination and the adoption of it in the corona situation. It was kind of a new technology. People didn't fully understand it, and this is why at least certain um, group of people um, had fears against the technology um, and um, were not willing to use it. And I think this is always the case if we have a new technology where we are not very sure yet on what is the impact, how will it be used, will it really work. Um, and at, at some point the technology will be established and we will not talk so much about this anymore, but we don't know yet how these AI algorithms will be used. And this is why there's a certain fear. And I think at some point we will be in a situation where it's just normal that these AI algorithms are kind of defining at least part of our lives and we trust the technology. And maybe then we are asking different questions about even new technologies that are coming up. This is a, a new and emerging field, but presumably you have quite a number of competitors. That's correct, and, and the reason is that there is a huge strategic aspect to it. Um, and this is why, we, um, even though it's an emerging technology, we see quite a lot of uh, very established big um, companies um, being there. Um, and it starts in the US, of course, with the big names like IBM, Google, Amazon. But then also if you go to China, so you see Huawei and Alibaba. I think now speaking as a European, the challenge is that in Europe, we don't have, unfortunately, we don't have any of, of those names uh, in, in Europe. So no big tech companies who would say, okay, 
I go all in and, and we will also build quantum computers and to develop the technology. And this is why all the hope in Europe um, is on the startups, because still the Europeans uh, want to have the technology. Um, and, and I'm talking a lot also with people in Brussels and in different governments. How can we then make sure that those startups are successful? And what we are implementing, and it brings us back to your question about the products and selling already, what we are implementing here is kind of a SpaceX model. So if you look at SpaceX, the first revenues they made, the hundreds of millions came from NASA and other government organizations. And um, this allowed them to get more private um, investments in. And this is exactly at the moment the strategy in Europe that we have very good startups um, and they need to make uh, revenues in order to get further private investments in order to be compete uh, with all the big names out there. And this is why we have actually very ambitious programs to buy quantum computers into big computing centers all around Europe um, and help the European startups grow and be a global player in this big race. What does success look like? Well, I'm a physicist, so my motivation is to build a large-scale quantum computer that can really solve those problems where otherwise we wouldn't get the answers to. So my motivation from the beginning was always, okay, I want to see such a machine. And at some point it was clear that, okay, it's not going to be the universities that are building these large-scale machines because universities are not institutions where you do large system integration. Universities are good in fundamental science, really pushing the boundaries of, of physics and, and other things. And they will still play a major role also in the future because there's still a lot of uh, groundbreaking technology to be discovered. But the actual machines will be built by private industry because there is where you usually have the expertise in system integration. And um, this is why I and, and my co-founders, we, we took the decision to actually spin out from the university and uh, do it um, through a startup. And so in this sense, for me, success means at some point have a machine that solves a practical problem, so a problem with a real use case, um, much, much faster than any conventional supercomputer that we have. So just going back to the product again, at the moment what you're selling is some pieces of hardware and presumably support. You, you actually have staff helping your customers to make the thing work. Yeah, so I mean, we are selling a complete system. So as a customer, um, you get it delivered to your premise, kind of you need electricity, a little bit of cooling water, um, you turn it on and then you have a computer. So you have a machine that can that compute something, but the use cases are of scientific nature. So you are studying still fundamental science. But of course, also those customers, these computing centers, they are not used um, to run a quantum computer. So we do educate them. What does it mean? What kind of skills do you need? And also the scientists, they are not used to run their problems on quantum computers. Um, so also them, as you described, we are educating them in how to run an algorithm, maybe how to adopt the algorithm to the problem that they want to use. Actually, we have a quite um, strong effort on education as such. Um, and we have employees who do nothing else than educating people. And it starts from C-level decision makers. It goes all the way down to students and, and school uh, classes where we do hackathons because um, we want that people like the, the, um, the society understands what is quantum all about and why does it make sense to really invest into the technology now. So we are selling computers and we are offering on top services to educate the, the scientists, decision makers and the broader society on what is it actually uh, that is quantum all about. So what are the biggest challenges you face? So the, the computers still need to develop, the technology still needs to scale. And this is, of course, a, a challenge by itself. It is not so that we still have, let's say, unanswered questions. So the computers that we have work and we really need to scale them. So it's not that we still need to crack some like fundamental physical questions, um, but the technology as such is very com complex. Um, and this is a, a challenge and you need a lot of good talent for it and a lot of um, capital because in the end we are producing hardware and this, so for example, we are um, running a clean room, a, a fabrication facility, um, which is by itself a very um, kind of big investment. So we need to get the best people in and, and we need to have the investments. And, and this is of course a challenge also by itself because we are competing with very, very big names. Um, and then the question is, how can you raise money for such a story? How can you attract the best people if they could also get jobs in, in other companies? So these are typical challenges that we have on the way going forward. 
What would be your advice to young people who would like to work in this field? Um, my advice is do where you have a fascination for. So if you're fascinated by technology, by computing, mathematics, um, any of those fields, really pick something um, that really fascinates you and, and really um, go for it. I don't think it makes sense just because there is a hype in a certain technology to say, okay, now I go into this field because probably there will be opportunities, but actually what I like is something completely different. So I think that's, that's important. Really follow your heart and do what you like. Um, and, and, and then you will find your opportunities and they might be in quantum computing, they might be in, in something else. In the end, quantum computing will be a complete industry. So you don't need to be a specialist actually in quantum physics. And what we need very much also is people who understand the use cases. And we need people who can communicate between those worlds. So if you think your strength is more in understanding technology, but then being able to be a kind of a mediator between someone who does um, health tech or does um, finance, we need people who can explain from, from a financial expert to a quantum physicist how, how those worlds connect. So it doesn't really matter where your skills are, um, there will be um, a need for you anyways. We need marketing experts, we need people who take care of all the regulatory um, topics. So it will be a complete industry and in this sense there will be a job for, for everyone. Um, but again, you need to be fascinated by the technology in the end um, to really, I think, flourish in the field. That's great. Thanks very much. Well, thanks for having me. It was really a pleasure being here. Thank you very much for being with us for this episode of the Idea Me Show. Idea Me is a global platform. Our mission is to move the human story forward by sharing knowledge of the future. You can find us on all major audio networks at www.radioideame.com, on YouTube and Vimeo. Please subscribe.